I'm Janice Call. I'm usually standing over there and uh, or sitting over there with the choir or playing handbells. I'm pastor of congregational care here at Charleston Wesley, and in about three more months, I will have been I finished my first year. It seems like forever that I've been with you, but I want you to to welcome you to our service today. I hope you're glad to be here. The day is beautiful. I, if you went out for a walk early, the sun is shining and, and uh, God's glory is out there. I hope you're glad to be here. And so if you are, I want you to turn to two people that you didn't come with and say, I'm really glad to see you, real quickly. Okay, that's, that's good. <clears throat> this is when the, when, the, when the cat's away, the mice are play. Well, the cat is in Paraguay, so we can play all we want to. Um, how many of you are here came with your family? Raise your hand. If you came with, with some, somebody in your family, that you came with your family. Um, let me see your hands. Let's see how many came with family here. Okay. Actually, all of you should have raised your hand because we are all part of the family of God. And so I want you to turn to somebody that you didn't just turn to and shake hands and say, Howdy, church cousin. Oh, we, we can do this all the time, can't we? Uh, how many of you have ever squabbled with your parents or your siblings in that family in which you belong to? Um, and sometimes you won and sometimes you didn't win and sometimes you had to compromise, right, so that you could get back to be a loving. And so today we're going to talk about what it means to be a part of the family of God. And uh, I want to take a few minutes to give you some family news. Uh, first, Reverend Swickard is in Paraguay uh, right now helping with a medical mission there. He's gone with another church to see about the possibility of perhaps doing that uh, in a year or so with our church. And we want to pray for him, and we look uh, forward to his return in the pulpit. I certainly will next Sunday. Um, Second, because I forgot to do this the first time I was preaching for you, you, in your bulletin you will find a connection card. Now, let me tell you, some of you, I know about half of you do not sign the cards, because if we just counted the cards, we would have half as many people here as really do. But we do look at them, we pray for the, the people as a staff uh, who, uh, uh, that you put on here for your joys and your concerns. It really helps us to keep up with you. So if you don't mind, you don't have to write a bunch, but just stick your name on there and put it in the collection plate. If you're a visitor, if you will put your, uh, your name and address so we can send you mailings and, and we can welcome you to your church. If you are a visitor, don't take this as a regular Sunday. Come back next Sunday, you'll have a real good sermon. Uh, uh, let me see what else. That's the first bill, the first announcement, or second announcement. The third one uh, uh, is that in the insert for the upcoming events, you will find an announcement about ABC, our Adventure Bible Camp, that we're going to have in just one week. And Cindy Evanger is not here, but she has given us a video about that week that she would like for us to watch. In a world that needs Jesus more than ever, Give him a good high five. one team of ordinary people has assembled for a mission of a lifetime. I just don't think I can make it. You're going to make it, even if I have to carry you. Come on! Guts. 
probably some free food. Seems like the team's really coming together. There's just one more thing we need to do to make this a high-performing, cohesive unit. What's that? <laughs> yeah, I need two low-fat caramel mochas, uh, one soy latte, and two strawberry iced teas. Hey, Grandma. Oh, Tommy, I'm so glad you're here. Why don't you and your friends go and put these on? Thanks, Anna. Bye, have fun. This summer, get ready for your church to be part of the action. Excuse me, pardon me. Excuse me. All right, everybody. There's only one thing we're missing. You. Sign up today to be part of the action. Cindy asked me if I would get out on my knees and beg. Now, I want you to know, if I got out on my knees, somebody would have to come and help me up. <laughs> and I understand last year you had more volunteers almost than you had kids, and this year it's not the so. I guess everybody said, but we've got plenty of help. We don't need any. We, we are planning for 50 children. We have 10 people who have signed up to help. And so the main, the main leaders have all been chosen. We just need some people to go around with the groups and some people to help uh, do various to be helpers some adult helpers and there's a sign-up sheet at, uh, around in the hallway right here if you can you can sign up there if you don't want to put your name in in the light so that everybody knows you've signed up use this connection card and just say I'll be glad to come help next week and I don't know much more about it except I'm gonna be there and I'm gonna be working and I'd love to see you there but let Cindy know that we care about this church and we want children to be a part and so if you can at all come not this week but next week it'll be five days two and a half hours they're cutting the time down so uh, if you can please help also in your announcements there is a, a need for a new usher team for the 1045 services now don't you all rush out and sign out for it because i like you all sitting right here at 8 30. <laughs> but if you know of somebody that comes to the 1045 would you tell them that we need some ushers there um, there are other news uh, in there for you to read in your bulletin uh, the last thing I want to do officially is to say that uh, we do have a, 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 a parent, a, a family who has agreed to keep Sophie Delgado, our, our international student who's coming uh, from Lima, Peru, to be with us. And we had uh, a lot of you who, who, who came up to me and said, I can't do it for a whole year, but I can do it, could we do it part of the year? And we were almost at that point, and then we've had some people who have, had volunteered. So I wanna thank all of you who helped uh, and who questioned yourself and who said, is this a way we can serve? And so we want to support the Pearson family as, as they welcome her as she begins her study with EIU. Uh, each month, our church family takes on a, a mission, different mission project, and so I invite Joanne Gregg to come forward and give us information for about, about our project for this month. The mission ministry team, that's our new name. We read in our last newsletter that we are no longer work areas. We've been committees, we've been commissions. Now we are a team. So we want you to join us. We picked an old favorite for July. Volunteers bought fabric, volunteers cut fabric, volunteers sewed fabric. So we have over 100 bags that need to be filled. Um, with what? The list is here. And it's also in the bag. Where are they going? We really don't know. These are UMCOR bags. That means we will take them to the Midwest Distribution Center near Chatham, and they will ship them to Salt Lake City, which is the official UMCOR distribution center. UMCOR sends these bags anywhere there's a disaster, and they ask for help. They will go to children who don't have school supplies. So we really hope you will help. The, as I mentioned, the list is specific. I know you'd like to put in a cute little 
pencil sharpener or a message, but please don't do that. Uh, follow the list. We're going to be in the hallway afterwards handing out the bags, and we'll hope you'll take maybe more than one. So, as always, your missions ministry team thanks you for your support. Thank you, Joanne. I hope through all of these announcements you see that even in the summer we are a really busy church family. There are people to help, fun things to do, and people to pray for. As we call ourselves into worship, I want us to sing a chorus of a popular Gaither song uh, that's called The Family of God. And in case you don't know the tune, I'm going to ask Carrie to play it through once. Now, you need to listen to directions. This is the third grade teacher in me. We're gonna, he's going to play it through once. The choir is going to sing it once. And then I want the ladies to sing it the next time, the men to sing it, and then we're going to all join in as the family of God. It's not long, and I think we'll learn it, but if, how many of you know that song already? Okay, then you can sing out. What a good family reunion we're having this morning. But you know, sometimes reunions come in families for sad events that pull the family together. This week in our country, there have been some tragic events that have taken over the news waves and, the, and, and our thoughts. Having a son and a daughter-in-law and grandchildren and my sister and her family li all living in the Dallas area, the events that have occurred have left a big heaviness in my heart. As I watched and listened to the reports, I heard comments from uh, various people on each side, from police chiefs to uh, wives and mothers of the slain victims, of mayors and of um, governors and even presidential candidates. And as I listened to them, some of their, some of their uh, sayings I think was, were appropriate to us. And this is what I heard, and it's from just a, a myriad, it's just a few of them. One of them said, we need to all get along. This has to stop. Another one, it's not us versus them. It's us working together. Another, we must see each other as human beings and respect humanity. 
Churches need to get together to pray and then work for peace in our land, and not just my church, but all churches. Just because we are black and white doesn't mean we can't speak in shades of gray. We need to turn to each other, not against each other. Let's listen respectfully to each other and work together. When I looked for answers within myself, one hymn stood out. Because of that, I have decided uh, to change the opening hymn from the one that I had originally planned. So I want you, I think the words will be up here, if they got the words up, it's number 431. The words are up there. Let there be peace on earth. Uh, let's stand um, as a moment of tribute to the fallen. Uh, I want us to pause for a, a few moments of silent prayer for the victims in, in each of the tragedies uh, this past week and their families for all those involved and for all who try to keep our country a safe place and for the division and violence which continues to threaten our very nation. As you pray silently, I'll ask Harry to play through this hymn, Let There Be Peace on Earth Once, and then we will all join in that family prayer song together. Let us stand in unity as a family of God to pray for our country now and for others.
join me in prayer? Holy, Holy and gracious God, God of all, we give thanks to you for all the blessings of this day. We thank you for sending us your Son, that we might know how to live and how to serve. We are very grateful that you have called us to be a part of your family of God and to be kingdom builders for you. We want to be your hands and feet to this great world, but too often, O oh Lord, our own needs and wants get in the way. Too many times our perception of what's right is based on our own desires and prejudices rather than your Holy Spirit and will. We don't want to include others. We want to stick to our old ways and our own kind. Create in us clean hearts, O oh God, and renew a right spirit within us. Open up our hearts and minds to the joy and fulfillment that we know is found in true worship of you and in loving service to all others in need. We ask all these things in your most precious name. Amen. Seated, and we welcome our second Sunday singers.
say amen. amen. Uh, at this time, if we will sing the first stanza of Oh How He Loves You and Me, I invite Kathy Wright to come and uh, lead us uh, in our children's time together. Good morning. How are you guys? Good. It is, it's a beautiful day out today, isn't it? Yes, it is. And it's going to be nice and comfortable. It's not going to be hot and sticky today. That's great. Well, how many of you have ever heard this say? Have you ever heard this? Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words can never hurt me. Have you ever heard that? I know the congregation has. Grew up with it, right? <laughs> yes, that's my. I had people tell me that. Well, how many of you believe that? No, it's not. That's one of those things that is not right, is it? Words can hurt us. Have you ever had somebody say something to you that really hurt their feeling? That hurt your feeling? Yes. Have you ever said something that might have hurt somebody else? Probably we all we all do that because words can hurt us. But do you know something else? Words can also bring us up. Words can help us feel good and feel great, right? How many of you ever had a teacher that says, "Way to go, right? Good job." You ever had anybody say that to you? How does that make you feel? makes you feel good, doesn't it? That's right. Well, I, those are words of encouragement. Now, what do you think encouragement is? What do you think encouragement is? Bringing up. Right. Well, I looked it up in the dictionary. Even though I thought I knew what it was, I looked it up in the dictionary. Well, actually, I have to be honest. Dictionary.com. My new friend. I looked it up. And this is what it says. It says, uh, encouragement means to give courage or hope or confidence to give support and help to one another. Does that sound right? You know what it also said in there? It said that, encourage, that encouragement or praise is the best kind of encouragement. Now, can you think of times in your life when you really needed someone to encourage you to do something. You just won some swimming things, didn't you? Were you in the swim? Did you have somebody who was, I read somewhere on Facebook that somebody got medals for swimming. Do you think when you're out on playing, how many of you have ever played t-ball or out? Yeah. <laughs> now, does your coach encourage you? Does your coach say, you can do it, good job, way to go? Is mom and dad out there going, yay, yay? Yes, no. You, you really encourage someone to help them do something, right? And can you encourage somebody if they're feeling bad? Yes, you can. I'm going to tell you something. I taught school for 35 years. And believe it or not, sometimes I got down. Sometimes I'd go, oh, I don't know if I can make it today. Then some boy or girl would say something to me. They might say, ooh, cool glasses, Mrs. Wright. Or, I really like those shoes, Mrs. Wright. Or, hey, the Cubs finally won, Mrs. Wright. <laughs> and you know what? It just brought me right back up, and I just felt so much better. Well, God wants us to encourage each other. And there's this verse in the Bible that I really like, and it's Thessalonians, it's 1 Thess Thessalonians uh, chapter 5, verse 11, and this is what it says, 
Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up, just as in fact you are doing. So God wants us to encourage each other, even though we might not want to, right? Sometimes it can be hard. Uh, the world is in a, it's been having some bad problems lately. And part of it is because people are saying things that are really, really hurtful to each other. And our first inkling when somebody says something to us is to say something back at them, right? Is that what we should do? Is that going to make anybody feel any better? Is it going to make anything change? I'm just so sick of all the hurtful words that's been said by adults. You guys, you kids are going to have to show us the way. You're going to have to encourage us, and we're going to have to encourage you. So what I want you to do today, well, first of all, these are some different kinds of encouragement. What's that say? You're number one. Does that make you smile if someone says, hey, Tanner, you're number one? Does that make you feel good? That was a super, super job, right? Does that make you feel? How's that? I'm just saying, super job. How about this word? Awesome. Is that a good word? When someone says awesome to you, is that a good word? Ah, what about this? Keep trying. Is that a word of encouragement? Yes. It can be, because sometimes we, we don't get everything perfect. So if someone says, keep trying, it, that makes you feel good, right? Unless you've got the one good job, or what's it say? Way to go, or this is one of my favorites. Never give up, never give up. So those are all words of encouragement. So what I want you to do this week stickers and I want you to give out some stickers of encouragement to people okay this week I want you to and these are I've got all kinds of them but these are sort of glittery and pretty right so I want you to take those and I want you to give some stickers to somebody there's some different different words of encouragement. You can use these too. And I want you to get, and I want to want you to see if it brings a smile to their faces. All right? Okay, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for these children. And dear Lord, help us to remember that we need to encourage each other. We need to thank each other for things that people do for each other. We need to encourage everybody and speak good of each other. In this hurting world, we do need the praise of encouragement to help us solve the problem. We need peace among us. We need to work together, and we can do that if we encourage each other. We ask this all in your precious name. Amen. Jesus to Calvary did go His love for sinners to show What he did Come to the time now of, and ushers, if you will prepare to come to come down, a uh, time when we uh, give back to God out of the gratefulness of our hearts for all that He's done for us. If you're a visitor here, we do not expect you to participate, but of course you may. It's one of our church's way of helping the the kingdom building of God and of serving those in need. And so I appreciate your connection cards as well. So if you will come forward, ushers, and then uh, we'll take the offering.
Our scripture reading this morning comes from Romans 12, verses 1 through 18. It is found in your pew Bibles on pages 161 and 162 of the New Testament. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of yourself more highly than you ought to think, but to think with sober judgment each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as, as in one body we have many members, and not all members have the same function, so we who are many are one body in Christ, and individually we are members one of another. We have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, prophecy in proportion to faith, ministry in ministering, the teacher in teaching, the exhorter in exhortation, the giver in generosity, the leader in diligence, the compassion in cheerfulness. Let love be genuine. Hate what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with mutual affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not lag in zeal. Be ardent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in suffering. Persevere in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saint. Extend hospitality to strangers. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty but associate with the lowly. Do not claim to be wiser than you are. Do not repay anyone evil for evil, but take thought for what is noble in the sight of all. If it is possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. You can see it takes a village to do a worship service, and I want to thank all of you uh, who have helped with volunteer uh, in, for our homebound and for uh, giving uh, your flowers to, for us to be able to take around to some who, who don't get uh, fresh flowers very often. And I just need to tell you that Lois told me that those flowers came from her garden. So I want you to look and see the beauty of them. Thank you, Lois, for, for sharing that. But for all of you, uh, from the staff who have helped me uh, get ready for this. It's been a crazy week, um, and I'm glad that you're here. Friends, Romans, countrymen, lend me your ears. Now, that is not just the famous uh, line that was said by Mark Anthony in Shakespeare's uh, Julius Caesar. It's not only what uh, Lowell Gillespie sends to those of us in the Living Word Sunday School class now that we're studying Romans when he gets ready to tell us it's our time to do the hospitality. I think those lines are also what Paul was doing in his letter to the home churches in Rome. They were no longer a part of the Jewish uh, church, which is what uh, Jesus had intended them to be, um, but had been kicked out of the, out of the Jewish church. And, but they are Jewish Christians in Rome. They're also Gentiles who were uh, the non-Jewish the non ones as a part of these churches. 
And one of the purposes that Paul had in his letter, uh, that, uh, which was written to a ch a house churches that he, the only letter that he wrote to house churches that are churches that he did not start and had never had visited. And his, one of the purpose was to tell, to, to tell him, get ready, because I'm coming to check on you guys. And I think the second reason that was probably because uh, he had heard of the tensions that were going on between the groups of the Jewish Christians and the groups of the Gentiles or the, the non-Jewish people who are part of those house churches. The Jewish churches, uh, the Jewish uh, Christians were very legalistic, conservative, uh, one might say, in their understanding of the church because they saw Jesus as the fulfillment of all the laws and all the Jewish laws still had to be held that Jesus was the fulfillment of that. The Gentiles, not being Jewish, had never been a part of the Old Testament legalism. Therefore, their understanding of God was built on a theology uh, only around the life and death and resurrection of Jesus. Now, you can picture conservative versus liberals, uh, picture old versus new, picture former Jews versus uh, non-Jews, picture worship within the understanding of past Jewish heritage, versus worship of new Christians with no tie at all to Jesus' heritage. Varied perceptions, perspectives within one group of believers. Now, does that sound like a recipe for conflict in the church? It doesn't take much knowledge of the news this week to see the tension between differing perspectives that has caused problems in both our state and national governments, in violence in our country, and it even threatens to divide our own United Methodist denomination. As if the tension was not enough, in 49 AD, the emperor, Christian emperor, Christian emperor Claudius, uh, expelled all of the Jews from Rome because naturally the Jews were the ones who had crucified Christ. And so the Jewish Christians had to go, they were Jews, so they had, they were, which just left the Gentile Christians being a part of this church for five years. And so what do you, what do you think they thought? Huh? This is God's punishment on all those Jews because they crucified Jesus. It's really our way that's best. Well, after five years, uh, another emperor came in and let them all come back in. So now here comes back the other Jewish, former Jewish Christians uh, into the Gentile Christians now owning the church. And the, the feeling of superiority but, uh, that the Gentiles now felt uh, led to cliquishness and dissension with, within these house churches. Each side had their reasons for their beliefs, and each side felt that they were in the group that was in the right. So it was to this issue of division that uh, Paul was writing and planning to visit. Conflict between, in, within the early church, this is you know, 30 years after Jesus has died. People forming cliques and thinking they were superiors to the others. Can you believe that happened in a church? Thinking that your beliefs and thoughts are more important and have more weight than others who also claim to be Christian? Dissension within God's house? Just imagine that. Certainly that would never happen in today's churches or within our own church. Clicks? We don't have clicks. What do you mean, not welcoming others? We have greeters standing at that door every Sunday. That's their job. Not getting along with each other? We would never do that. One of my favorite songs I learned in Sunday school when I was a kid, now somebody told me it must have been a Texas song because they didn't know it up here, it was called Friends, 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 I have some friends I love. I love my friends and they love me. I help my friends and they help me. Do you all know that? Friends, 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 thank you. Have some friends I love. And I love that because it made me feel good about going to church and having friends. As I talked about uh, and as I studied this passage from Paul, and what's going on in our world, all of a sudden I thought, you know what, that, that word does not, uh, doesn't say the same kind of thing. Uh, that song says, I love those who love me, and I help those who help me. It doesn't say anything about those who I deem not good enough or rich enough or moral enough or good looking enough by my standards to be loved and to be a part of God's kingdom. The song, I think, lends itself to thoughts like, the church is for me and my kind. There are plenty of other churches in town. Let them go there. Ouch. We would never say that, those words, but do our actions show a different understanding? Paul, in this letter essay of Rome, writes that the good news of God's liberating and transforming salvation in Christ is for all people, both Jews and non-Jews, conservatives and liberals, rich and poor, people who act and, and look like us and people who don't. 
We are people of differing understandings and gifts, but we are united within one family of God through the grace of our Savior, Jesus Christ. I want us to look at what Paul is saying to the people about the tensions within the church at Rome and likewise to us. You see, what we have read and uh, heard read in today's text is Paul's understanding of our connection with God and with each other. And as I thought about the words, I really didn't find them in any commentary, but it seemed to me this is Paul's commentary on Jesus' greatest commandment, the commandment that we are to love God with all our heart, with all our being, with all our mind, and we are to love our neighbors as we love ourselves. So first, Paul says we're to be living sacrifices. Animal sacrifices were done in Israel's past, and even in Paul's day, it was not what God wants. God desires our love and our life totally, all our thoughts and our words and our actions. It is a natural response to love God with everything we have when we truly love God with every fiber of our being. And we realize, as we did this morning, when we woke up and saw the flowers and the beautiful sun, uh, all of God's countless blessings, the greatest of those is grace through Christ. We love because God first loved us. We're called to worship and to serve God every day and everywhere we go. Uh, living as a sacrifice to God is more than just coming to worship on Sundays and sitting in these pews and trying to figure out what you're going to cook for dinner for the rest of the family. Uh, we're called to worship and to serve God. Doesn't that sound like Jesus' command to love God with our whole being? When we accept Christ into our hearts, not just in our words, in our, our entire personhood is changed. And we are transformed by the Holy Spirit. And my question to us today is, do you live out your life with the realization that the life you live is an offering to God? Do you connect with God daily through prayer? Do you use every worship service to help you focus on the power of the Holy Spirit to allow your life to become a sacrifice to the one who created and saved and lives within you? Secondly, Paul turns our relationship in his letter to, uh, to each other, and I think this is Paul's commentary on the second part about loving your neighbor as yourself, and you heard those rules that Joyce uh, read to us in, in there, and I'd like for you to make yourself a little checklist if you want to later on. You know, love sincerely with the love that's real, without hypocrisy or selfish motives. Be affectionate. Love one another as brothers and sisters in God's family and show honor to all. How many people showed honor at that day in Dallas? Be enthusiastic about your faith, but don't give in to apathy. Serve God and others using the gifts God has given to you. Rejoice in hope. Pray always. Share with those in need. Become hooked on giving, not getting. Show hospitality always. Pray for and bless those who hurt you because that's what uh, Jesus' words and his example told us, to meet persecution with prayer and not retaliation. Feel one another's pain and joy. Be so close to one another that you share one another's ups and downs. Live in harmony with one another. Avoid pride because that brings discord. Be friends to everyone, even the lowliest person, for this is the example that Jesus sets. Be modest. Don't make yourself seem smarter than you are. Now, I've got that one. I don't think any of you know that I'm smarter than anybody else. Be fair and just, setting a good example for all to see. Live at peace with all people as far as it is in your power to do so. Respond to your enemies with kindness and practical concern. Be on fire in the spirit is what Paul says, and that reminds me of the two flames in our United Methodist emblem. And that reminds me of something that I taught my third graders for 30 years. And do you remember what we were ever to do if we get caught on fire? We are to stop, drop, and roll. And my students practice those, and I think uh, Paul was helping the church understand what being a follower of Christ really means um, when we act out of love. Unfortunately, it is much easier said than done. Too many times we think only of our wants and our needs, and we think our old perceptions of things and ideas are best. If we're sincere about living, being, uh, living sacrifices of gratitude, we may need to train ourselves to be more loving by stop dropping and rolling. We need to stop to realize that we represent Christ to others. Uh, take notice of others around you, not just your friends. There was a purpose in my having you say something to somebody that didn't come with you. Uh, God counts on us to be his hands and feet in the world and within these walls. 
He needs us at hospitality hour, in Sunday school, in the parking lot, in the pews. He needs us in long grocery lines or school classrooms or workplaces or when you're in a spot that the tensions seem to start rising. A smile can break down a lot of frowns and ugliness. But once you've stopped to realize that you represent Christ to others, you need to drop your own self-centeredness and pride. Greet not only those you know, but more importantly, those you don't. Drop yourself in your own agenda for a moment and con contribute to the needs of others. This is counter what, to what the world tells us to look out for number one. We're to put aside what we want and, and let the other's needs go first. We should look at others at poten as potential friends, not potential enemies. Every person is made in the image of God, even if they or we haven't figured it out yet. Paul makes it clear in Romans that we are never to judge because only God knows each one's heart, secrets, and sorrows. And last, we must roll. Roll is a doing word. Once we have stopped to realize that we're living sacrifices to God and have put aside our self-wants, we must do something about it. We are to love and to help others as we want to be loved and helped. And as I looked at the word roll, it, it also reminded me of the bread that we break at communion. And uh, like the, the roll of bread that, that we use at communion that nourishes our bodies and souls, there are rolls that we can take to others that will nourish their hearts and bodies and minds. What we do towards welcoming others shows really whether we treat others as we would want to be treated. We should react to others as though they are as much a part of the family as God as we think we are. The Roman Christians had a problem because they felt their own cliques and their own perspectives were what mattered. It seemed they didn't try to work together to find a commonality. We all need friends, but sometimes our own friendships, as important as they are, keep us from being welcoming to the stranger. Sometimes our own thoughts of how the world ought to turn need to be reviewed in order for God's kingdom of love and justice to become real. We should not react um, to our perceived enemies, as Paul suggests, uh, like the world does but through revenge, but we should pray for and bless our enemies and overcome their hate with kindness. Remember, you are the only sermon that some people will ever see. Is the sermon you preach with your life one of prejudice or self-centeredness, of implicit bias or hatred or just plain apathy, or is it one of love and acceptance and inclusion? Of course, this is not easy, but that's why it's repeated over and over throughout the Old and the New Testaments. So what is our purpose of life in Christ, of being a part of this family of God? Jesus and Paul would both tell us it is to be a living sacrifice. It's holy and pleasing to God. It's to live in a community loving God with every fiber of our being and loving and serving others in Christ's name. It is to be a life-saving station for all who are drowning in the sea of life. Are we a life-saving station? I want to close our time together by sharing one of my favorite modern-day parables. Now, I want you to see if your perception of our church fits this story. On a dangerous sea coast where shipwrecks often occur, there was once a crude little life-saving station. The building was just a hut and there was only one boat, but the few devoted members kept a constant watch over the sea and with no thought for themselves, they went out day and night tirelessly searching for the lost. Many lives were saved by this wonderful little station, so it became famous. Some of those who were saved and various others in the surrounding areas wanted to become associated with the station and they gave up their time and money and effort for the support of that little station's work. New boats were bought, new crews were trained, the life-saving saving station grew. Some of the new members of the life-saving station were unhappy that the building was so crudely built and so poorly equipped. They felt that a more comfortable place should be provided as the first refuge of those saved from the sea. Do you see where I'm going? So they replaced the emergency cots with beds and put better furniture in a large building. Now the life-saving station became a popular gathering place for its members and they redecorated it beautifully from time to time and furnished it as a sort of club. Less of, I see, I hear a little, hmm, hmm, hmm. Less of the members were now interested in going to sea on life-saving missions, so they hired the boat crews to do this for them. The mission of life-saving was still given lip service, but most were too busy or lacked the necessary commitment to take part in life-saving activities personally. About this time, a large ship was wrecked off the coast and the hired crews brought in boatloads of cold, wet, and half-drowned people. They were dirty and sick, some of them had black skin, and some spoke a strange language, 
and the beautiful new club was considerably messed up. So the property committee, we call it something else, immediately had a shower house built outside the club where victims of shipwreck could be cleaned up before coming inside. At the next meeting, there was a split in the club membership. Most of the members wanted to stop the club's life-saving activities as being unpleasant and a hindrance to the normal life pattern of the club. But some members insisted that the life-saving was their primary purpose and pointed out they were still called a life-saving station. But they were finally voted down and told that if they wanted to save the life of all the various people, kinds of people who had, were shipwrecked in those waters, they could begin their own life-saving station down the coast, which they did. As the years went by, the new station experienced the same changes that had occurred in the old. They evolved into a club, and yet another life-saving station had to be founded. If you visit along that sea coast today, you will find a number of exclusive clubs along that shore. Shipwrecks are still frequent in those waters. Only now, most people drown. This parable gives us the picture of what we as a church should not be. And my final question to each of us is this. What kind of a, st a life-saving station are we at Charleston Wesley at this moment in time? Paul gave us the answer, I think. Uh, just what is it going to take for us to be the best life-saving station we can be? It's going to take prayer and a continued connection with God. It's going to take all of us making our lives a living sacrifice for God and not just giving meaningful significance on Sunday mornings. It's going to take making, uh, loving, and serving all others in the name of the one that we call Lord. It's going to take stopping to view the world with God's eyes, dropping our own agendas and prejudices, and then serving all those around us with the food and nourishment of grace and love. Living in Christian community should be life-saving for us and for others. Let us pray that God will change our hearts to make them into ones of love and acceptance, of gentleness and kindness for all inside and outside these walls. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Our response to God's words through Paul is to sing as a song of prayer, uh, Change My Heart, O God, and I want to ask, we'll ask Harry to play through it once as we gather uh, ourselves in another attitude of prayer for our country, for needs that you know, uh, and then we will sing once he's finished playing that. Make this be a song of prayer for, for us for, as a church and a family of God. Oh, holy God, let us always be living sacrifices for you and instruments of your peace as we love and serve others in your name. Change our hearts and tune them to your will and way. Be with our pastor, his team, and their mission. Bring them safely home. We pray for the ill, the frail, the homebound. We pray for those who grieve. 
in the midst of so much hurt and hatred, we know that you are there offering grace and love and peace. And for that, we are ever so thankful. May we become at all times, both now and forever, a protector for those without protection, a ship for those with oceans to cross, a bridge for those with rivers to cross, a sanctuary for those in danger, a lamp for those without light, a place of refuge for those who lack shelter, a guide for those who have lost their way, and a servant to all in need. All this we pray in the name of our Lord, who, when he was on earth, taught us to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us stand as we sing our closing hymn. It's help us accept each other. Uh, we'll sing just the first verse of this. Let us stand. come to church to be transformed and to be changed in the kind of a person that God calls us to be. As you go from this place, go knowing that you are a part of the family of God. Go with the knowledge that if peace is ever going to be reality in our lives, in our churches, and in our nation, it must begin with each of us. And may God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit go with you and keep you now, today, and always. Amen.